Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks uh, to the PTO and my alma mater, George Mason, for hosting this important conference. Uh, I think most of us in this room believe that inventors uh, deserve property rights and that patents encourage innovation. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not a universal view. Uh, criticism of the patent system has reached new heights. We have op-eds calling for limiting patent rights, and even reputable sources like The Economist have voiced a skeptical tone. Uh, some technology firms claim uh, patent, uh, that patent lawsuits erode their R&D budgets and bottom lines. And a few even call for abolishing the patent system. Um, and I should say also that my remarks are my own today and not necessarily those of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, but against that backdrop of this patent skepticism, proponents of inventors' rights might despair. Uh, but, but they shouldn't. Uh, we're here today to reorient the discussion, uh, to rediscover the fundamental principles that underlie our patent system, and to celebrate all that is right with uh, U.S. innovation. IP rights confer compelling benefits that patent skeptics overlook or discount. The U.S. economy itself stands as a shining reminder of everything that American innovation policy has achieved. And IP rights lie at the heart of that policy. And it's time to reassert the vital role of patents, and I commend you all for participating in today's conference. Uh, nevertheless, recent criticism of the patent system requires some explanation. Americans have long associated IP rights with ingenuity and held innovators in high esteem. So what happened to the conviction that innovators deserve proprietary rights, or that the American economy enjoys unparalleled success because it protects owners' interests? Perhaps four factors are responsible. First, patent assertion entities have drawn criticism. Second, patenting, uh, patenting technologies and commercializing them are increasingly separate acts undertaken by different entities and connected by patent licenses, if at all, after the fact. If technology users independently invent infringing technologies, some skeptics argue that patent lawsuits tax innovation instead of copying. Third, litigation costs make enforcing and defending against patent claims expensive. And finally, not all patents are valid. The welfare implications of these factors are complicated. But even if PAEs, ex post licensing, and high litigation costs sometimes produce imperfect outcomes, they do not undermine the patent system's core function. Today's patent regime drives a varied, complex, and evolving array of technologies. The markets in which novel products and methods arise are themselves changing. And now, of course, there are imperfections in how patents execute their mission. But such complications are no reason to abandon the patent system wholesale. Negativity has commandeered um, recent discourse, drowning out nuanced debate over how best to refine patent rights. And I worry that those with an agenda have leveraged some legitimate grievances into a larger anti-IP platform that would hinder U.S. innovation. So today, I propose that we honor our patent system, which traces back to the founding of our country. And with that goal in mind, I will argue that patents do indeed spur innovation. As I mentioned, several critics have questioned the premise of the patent system. Their claims deserve serious attention. But like many of you in the audience, I have evaluated claims of patent failure and found them wanting. In an article that I have forthcoming in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, I'll explain why. Abundant evidence links strong patents with R&D investment and economic growth. There's no question that patents are indispensable to innovation in the life sciences industry and crucial to many inventors elsewhere, too. Now, that's not to say that the evidence is in all respects unequivocal or that ever-expanding patent scope would always increase innovation. But viewed dispassionately, empirical leaning favors strong patents. By contrast, discarding, discarding or weakening inventors' rights would be reckless. So let me begin by contextualizing the issue. Patents have been at the heart of U.S. innovation policy since the founding of the country. They are recognized in the Constitution, and Congress passed the first patent statute in 1790, just one year after the Constitution's adoption. Patent rights have featured prominently in the realization and development of many of the country's most famous inventions. Patents remain objects of prestige within American society, 
which associates them with famous inventors like Thomas Edison, Samuel Morse, and the Wright brothers. And of course, property rights go to the core of American identity. But the case for maintaining our strong patent system isn't sentimental. It derives in part from the axiom in medicine, first, do no harm. And patents are big business in America. In 2015, the PTO received almost 630,000 patent applications and issued over 325,000 patents. U.S. firms represent half of the top 10 most prolific patent recipients. IBM tops the list, obtaining over 7,000 U.S. patents last year. Patent licensing is ubiquitous throughout the economy. And all told, patents are a major economic activity in which firms across many industries invest heavily. Hence, technology firms pay vast sums for patent portfolios, transferring value to upstream investors. For example, in 2011, the Rockstar Consortium paid $4.5 billion for Nortel's 6,000 patents. Google bought Motorola, Motorola Mobility and its 17,000 wireless technology patents for $12.5 billion later that year. In 2012, Microsoft bought 800 patents from AOL for over $1 billion. And in 2013, a consortium bought Eastman Kodak's digital imaging patents for $525 million. The U.S. patent system has gone hand in hand with extraordinarily high rates of innovation. America is the world's largest and most innovative economy. It boasts household names like Apple, Google, IBM, Microsoft, General Electric, Amazon, Uber, Lyft, Tesla, Snapchat, Instagram, Qualcomm, and more besides. Patents matter greatly to some of these companies, though less to others, depending on whether they are net users or licensees of intellectual property. But IP rights form part of the innovation environment in which all have arisen. Many of those firms apply for and receive hundreds, if not thousands, of U.S. patents annually. And that is the backdrop in which one should construe arguments in favor of abolishing or diluting patent rights. And it's a context to which patent skeptics pay little attention. Consider how radical calls for abolishing patents really are. To heed that call would be to discard a policy embedded not just in our country's entire history, but in a program that has overseen an economy uniquely successful in producing world-beating technologies. Abolition would also de deprive individual inventors, startups, and other small businesses of crucial benefits. Such people and firms may be unable to protect their otherwise appropriable technologies and to signal their scientific advances to prospective investors and customers. It seems to me that those advocating such a momentous change of direction, despite the success of our current approach, must justify their proposals with impressive evidence. Yet they tend to identify only fleeting abuses and non-systemic weaknesses, which targeted policy adjustments can solve. I see little empirical work suggesting that granting robust rights to the owners of valid patents restrict innovation. Of course, patents do not matter to some innovators who may rely on trade secrecy or first mover advantage to protect their inventions, or who innovate to survive under Darwinian competition. But that simply means that patents matter greatly to some inventors and less to others. It's no ground for discarding a system on which much R&D investment relies. And the industry that IP critics offer up as Exhibit A of a patent crisis, the information and communications technology industry, is thriving. Now, to be sure, not every patent skeptic embraces abolition. But proposals to weaken IP rights may reflect the same mistaken convictions and would likely set us on the wrong course. Some academics favor bringing certain inventions, like methods involving computer software or business methods, categorically beyond the reach of patent protection. Due to recent antitrust doctrine, owners of Frand and Cumbert standard essential patents cannot even ask a court for an injunction if the accused infringer arguably fits the loose description of a willing licensee. Calls for mandatory cost shifting in patent litigation, even in close cases, would transform incentives and not always for the better. Emerging competition regimes view unfairly high royalties as illegal under antitrust law and impose essential facility-derived doctrines on IP owners. So in short, a great deal is at stake, 
and it would be a disaster to change course only to find what I believe the evidence already supports. For innovation to thrive, it needs an ecosystem in which strong patents loom large. And it is to that evidence that I now turn. While, some time, while time constraints today merely allow a summary treatment, we can garner quite a lot from even a quick look at the evidence. First, as the Brookings Institute observed in 2013, patents are correlated with economic growth across and within the same country over time. And R&D spending since 1953 is highly correlated with patenting and the patent rate. Two studies, in particular, warrant mention. Scrutinizing cross-country data on R&D investment and patent protection from 32 countries from 1981 to 1995, Ken Warren Evanson found that the strength of intellectual property protection is positively and significantly associated with R&D. Thus, countries which provided stronger protection tended to have larger proportions of their GDP devoted to R&D activities. That study followed work by Park and Gennardi, who examined data from 60 countries between 1960 and 1990 to explore the relationship between IP rights and economic growth. They found that IPRs affect economic growth by stimulating the accumulation of factor inputs like research and development capital and physical capital, and that IPRs' benefits to growth are from encouraging the research sector to invest and take risk, except in developing countries. Second, firms respond to changes in the strength of patent protection. In a well-known study, for example, Hall and Zadonis examined the U.S. semiconductor industry between 1979 and 1995. They found that large-scale manufacturers have invested far more aggressively in patents during the period associated with strong U.S. patent rights, even controlling for other known determinants of patenting. Third, survey evidence reveals that patents are critical to innovation in some markets and relevant to a varying degree elsewhere. A Carnegie Mellon study published in 2000 surveyed approximately 1,500 R&D labs in the U.S. manufacturing sector in 1994. It found that among large firms, patents have the highest effectiveness scores in a number of industries, including drugs, toilet preparations, gum and wood chemicals, pipes, valves, oil field machinery, switchgear, and auto parts. In addition, while not being the top mechanism, patents have average scores of at least 50% in organic chemicals, fibers, turbines, generators, motors, industrial controls, and medical equipment. The data showed, however, that most firms in complex product industries do not consider patents, but first mover advantages, secrecy, and the exploitation of complementary capabilities as the key means of protecting their inventions. The authors stressed, however, that simply because respondents ranked one mechanism as being effective does not imply that other mechanisms are unimportant. Now, I only touch on the literature here in the most fleeting way, and if you're interested in my views on the larger body of evidence, you can read my article of when it comes out this fall. But in light of that evidence, I'm puzzled how commentators can proclaim that the pro-IP crowd lacks any evidence to support its position. As best I can tell, their critique faults us for not disproving the possibility that patents impose greater costs than they confer benefits. Consider this core observation. Studies keep finding a positive correlation between patent strength, private R&D expenditures, and economic growth. That finding matters to me, as it should to everyone who cares about getting innovation policy right. But it is also true that we must be cautious in extrapolating firm principles. The first rule of statistics is that correlation does not imply causation. An increase in patent protection may stimulate firms to spend more on R&D, thus producing more innovation and, in turn, greater economic growth. But perhaps a strong economy itself spurs more R&D investment in, by firms, which in turn obtain patents to bolster their market positions and earn higher economic rents. The economic relationship may also be multidirectional. Patents could both spur and result from innovation, which makes identifying precise causal inferences from the data extremely difficult. Now, patent skeptics fault us for not disproving that patenting may result from, rather than cause, economic growth, and what to make of that critique. First, it flips the appropriate burden. 
patents underlie successful innovation policies and correlate with R&D and economic growth. That fact warrants extreme caution before discarding or weakening IP protection. Indeed, eliminating patents would have immediate negative effects on the U.S. economy. Patent-specific investments would become stranded costs. Business models that rely on patents either for licensing revenue or to protect their inventions would cease to exist. Given the potential for economic disaster, what makes patent skeptics sure that the patent R&D economic growth correlation is not causal? Why would they jettison a system that, for better or for worse, coincides with America's immense rate of technological advance? What if they're wrong? And even if they're right as to segments of the economy, what of the sectors like biopharmaceuticals that rely on patents to justify billions of dollars of R&D expenditures? I've seen no satisfactory answers to those questions. There's a second problem. Statistical challenges make it hard to disprove a causal relationship from innovation to patenting. First, there are measurement problems. It's not easy, for example, to quantify innovation or to measure patent strength. Furthermore, international agreements, like the Treaty on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, better known as TRIPS, mean that similarly situated economies have adopted comparable patent systems. No major economy has jettisoned or severely diluted its patent system. Thus, natural experiments are rare. When a developed country alters the strength of its patent protection, the, changes, the change tends to be marginal. For instance, Japan in 1988, uh, excuse me, 88, strengthened its patent law by allowing inventors to obtain a patent containing multiple claims, and it did so in response to U.S. pressure. Researchers found no st statistically significant increase in innovation tied to the amendment. But that may simply mean that as an economy introduces ownership rights and technology, it may spur R&D. But eventually, further expanses in patent scope will have less benefits and may become negative. And it may mean that, patent, that the patent innovation relationship follows an inverse U-shape. Even if that is true, however, it, is not, it does not undermine the core proposition that patent rights boost incentives to invent and commercialize technologies. So I'll conclude with two points. First, the patent system is undergoing a period of significant reform. Even if there are faults within the IP system, recent changes in the law may have largely solved the problem. The AIA introduced post-grant and inter-parties review by the PTAB, which has invalidated patents at a high rate. The Supreme Court's Alice decision had le has led courts to invalidate many, cl many patents claiming computer-implemented methods, and the court also tweaked the law governing cost shifting and made several other changes, too. Second, recent work by the FTC illuminates certain patent uses that unequivocally benefit society. In its 2011 report, for example, the agency praised ex ante technology transfer in which owners of novel solutions sell their rights to downstream users, which then use those technologies to build new products. Such technology transfer efficiently and pro-competitively links inventors and consumers of technology. Hence, there are identifiable, recurring, and prominent examples of how patent licensing enhances economic welfare. And I look forward to the FTC's forthcoming PAE study, which will shed light on an issue that is crying out for empirical data in lieu of rhetoric. So in sum, I see compelling reasons to favor our patent system. Although we should continually scrutinize the status quo and adjust our policies and laws when necessary, we should do so in an evidence-based manner. And above all, we should respect the impressive body of evidence that supports strong IP rights. So thank you for your time, and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's a pleasure to hear somebody in Washington fight for strong patents, so thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Bob Schmidt, and I'm on the board of the National Small Business Association and the chairperson of a group called the Small Business Technology Council, which advocates on behalf of the 6,000 small business innovation um, research companies. And one of the things that you know we see is that patents are very important for some licensing technology companies that we 
heard before today, um, and it's very important for them. But for little businesses, they are absolutely critical because we can't survive without those patents. It's our primary asset. And a couple of factors which you didn't mention today, the Federal Reserve study which says patents are the number one indicator of regional wealth. More important than education, more important than infrastructure. And the fact that it means an additional $4,300 per worker being in a high patenting area than in a lower patenting area. So for a two-family household that works, that's $8,600 a year. It's quite. I, I think I cite that in my paper. So. Good. <laughs> Good. So my, my question is really, what can we do to try and shift this, you know, anti-patent legislation that we see it in the administration, we see it certainly in the legislature and also in the courts. So we're getting hit as small businesses where we're being decimated. I've seen companies and have firsthand experience with this where five and ten years ago, huge M&A deals, basically the same deal today can't be done at any, at, for any price because of the efficient infringement model where people have all just said, we're going to steal it too bad. You're too small. We don't care what you're doing. And I'm seeing this where these tiny companies are being decimated now. They're going out of business. They've cut back half um, in their scale. So we've stopped inventing. You go around to inventor groups, and they say, why would, I, why would I invent anything, or why would I apply for a patent? The patent is not worth the paper it's printed on. So we have Google buying patents for $3,000, with the Berkeley study saying it costs $38,000 to get a patent. So they're getting one-tenth of their legal cost back and not getting anything for all of the work that they've done. So what do we do as individual inventors and as you know, strong pro-patent people to try and shift this tide to swing the pendulum back? Well, I, I think that um, the narrative has been that um, big, faceless patent aggregators are going around and beating up on small businesses, right? We've, we've heard a lot of that. And, and you know, to, to be um, honest, the, you know, the FTC did bring one case against MPHJ, which was making demands on small businesses for invalid patents. But I don't think you're, that story that you've told about small inventors uh, sort of being exploited or you know ignored wiped out uh, by by big companies uh, that narrative is not widely known so I whatever you can do to make that more widely known I think w would be beneficial uh, whether through outreach to members of Congress or through some sort of um, you know grassroots campaign or, or something like that because what we really need in this debate is more balance, right? Is more voices, not fewer, not fewer voices. Because I think we have a narrative that's been convenient and easy to put on, you know, with a little cartoon figure, uh, but not necessarily a balanced debate. So I think th those kinds of voices would would really be, um, you know, a good addition. What do you want them to do? What can I go back and say to them to do to make an impact? Because a lot of us don't understand. You know, we're in the field. You know, there, I go to clubs, you guys. I do workshops for inventors. I've been doing licensing deals for 20 years. The world has really shifted for them. So they want to help, but they have jobs. They're trying to be inventors. They're trying to keep from, you know, save up enough money to get a patent that they find out is worthless. So, but what can I get them to do? I think there are some associations who already are um, sympathetic to those kinds of views, and I think perhaps working through those associations uh, to get this story out more w would be helpful. I realize, you know, a, an individual inventor in you know his or her house or uh, may not have the um, the time or the the resources to do it, but search out those associations, those groups who have already focused on this, and give them more of these kinds of personal individual stories. I think that that would help more voices. Well, I, I think you know, as a first start, look through some, of, look at some of those, you know, organizations. I know the American Conservative Union, for example, has been very uh, involved in this. There, are, there are many other organizations that might uh, be able to sort of bundle up these different stories and present them in a way that has more impact.
Hi, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> or talk to Adam Mussop. That would be another good idea. Um, so I'm very excited to see your paper. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> And one of the things I, I was wondering, and maybe this is in the paper, is um, you, you will be very hard pressed to find an economic study that proves causally that property rights in land are the cause of economic growth and a flourishing society. It's, there's substantial, strong correlations through historical evidence that property right, tangible property rights correlate with tremendous economic activity <laughs> And tremendous, uh, and tre tremendous economic growth. But the variables, of course, and how an economy grows are so wide ranging, you just couldn't control for it. And yet, we get the same, but yet the demand on, the, on property rights in intangibles, property rights in creative works, property rights in innovation, property rights in goodwill, um, all of a sudden this, the, the standard assumption flips. And now, no, we do have to have the exact study that shows causally otherwise they're deemed to be illegitimate. Um, I don't know if that, you know, if that kind of strange lack of, of uh, symmetry in our standards for try understanding the, the baseline justification for a property rights system, whether in land or, or in IP, um, <clears throat> has, been, has been identified before, or if you and if it's identified in your paper or not, it's worth identifying. Um, but could you do you have any thoughts on perhaps how this came about or where this might be coming from, given your um, lengthy years as as a thought leader and as and as a and as a commissioner? Um, so, so I agree that the, you know, as I mentioned in my speech, it seems the presumption is flipped that we've got to prove that you know. Uh, w without a doubt that strong IP rights equal innovation uh, and economic growth and if we don't prove that then patents you know should be should be diluted and I, I don't think I don't think that's appropriate and when, when you're talking about property rights you know, outside the IP area I uh, was thinking of something I think Friedrich Hayek said which is uh, before you tear down a fence understand why it's there right so um, but I uh, one of the things that um, uh, that, that I would, why is this coming to the fore? Why is this happening now? I mean, I do think that there have been, uh, uh, there's been a change in the invention model so that we used to have very integrated um, invent, invention, innovation systems where you had like, for example, Bell Labs, right, who might invent it and then commercialize it. And, and that, that has changed, right? So we're, so the model of invention and commercialization has changed. Uh, and there are some legitimate questions to be raised about the litigation system and costs imposed and are there asymmetric costs there. And I, I think we need to look at those uh, seriously. Uh, but I am afraid that taking some of those discrete uh, changes and challenges has been um, sort of expanded into a wider narrative that the problem is the patent system. And as I've been out, you know, I travel around the country, I talk to a lot of different businesses, and in some places, um, in technology companies, they've said to me, I, I don't, I don't, you know, value the patent system. I think it's really just a hindrance and we should, we should get rid of it. Um, and I was very surprised about that because I think, well, I bet you care a lot about the copyright of your name. I bet you care a lot about the, the look and feel of your product. Uh, but you are a net user of some of uh, some core technology. So you, you want to sort of protect your part that's important and say, well, that other part. And it's in every company, of course, will have some incentive to reduce the cost of inputs. Right, um, and so I think that's natural. The question is, is it appropriate? Is it, is it measured to the, the problem that might actually be a, a legitimate problem? More questions? Well, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Olhausen very much for that uh, excellent uh, remarks and uh, very much appreciate it. And I think we had some good Q&A. So thank okay, you very well, much. Thank you, everyone.